This is Veterans Memorial Auditorium at Des Moines, Iowa, the capital city of Iowa, which is located in the grassroots of agriculture country. This is a setting for the National Farmers Organization meeting for action. No price, no production. Silence is golden, according to an old maxim. But in time of crisis, it can be costly. When vital issues are at stake, silence denies democracy and invites justice. The present crisis in the countryside is a time for speaking, and the time seems to be now. The ma majority of the nation's farmers, as well as businessmen, church leaders, and others, all realize that collective bargaining is the key to the farmer's success. The Main Street businessmen know that they have just as much at stake in agriculture as the farmers themselves. For all new wealth comes from raw materials, and agriculture produces about 70% of the nation's raw materials. The remaining 30% is from oil, coal, minerals, and the stones and others. Every industry in America, the manufacturers, the processors, and the laboring class in every city, all depend on raw materials for their production. The wealth of this nation from this production and proper pricing of the production at every level is the key to full employment, to prosperity, and a high standard of living. The silence of the American farmer is to be lifted here today with some 30,000 farmers, which is expected to be attendance here and the largest in the world under one roof. This is U.S. Farm Report, and I am Don Mack, along with Ed Shima and Phil Allen, will be bringing this to you, which is sponsored by the members of the National Farmers Organization. Now we will go to the Des Moines Municipal Airport where Phil Allen is covering the airplanes and the farmers as they come into this meeting. This big four motor DC-6 mainliner is not part of a regularly chartered or scheduled airline. This is a charter flight which a number of Pennsylvania people have taken for this occasion coming to Des Moines here to attend the big meeting for action. It uh, seats about to oh, upwards. You see there Pennsylvania NFO, no price, no production. There will be upwards of 80 or 90 people getting off this plane and uh, the reason we're out here today to talk to these folks is not that this is the only chartered flight, this is just one of the big ones. One of the 80 or 90 passengers aboard the big uh, mainliner that came into the Des Moines airport was Dave Dickerson, who is an extension service representative from the state of Pennsylvania. He's assistant extension agent for Erie County. Uh, welcome to Des Moines, Dave. Thank you. Now, as an observer, I understand in uh, discussing this with you a moment ago that you're here just to observe this big meeting for action of the NFO. Uh, could you tell us a bit about the agriculture in Pennsylvania? Well, it's uh, quite a bit different here from Iowa. We have uh, a lot more rolling hills. Uh, our soil isn't quite as good as what you have out here. And I, I suppose it isn't the same kind of emphasis as we have in what some, I suppose you folks would think of this as the corn livestock area. Uh, yes, in Erie County, uh, we have uh, potatoes and dairy, and we have a small fruit, uh, fairly good sized fruit belt there along the lake. And so Mr. Dickerson is here as an observer from the state of Pennsylvania, and I expect that one of the significant things about this is that there are enough uh, folks in Pennsylvania, who belong to the NFO, that they chartered a whole mainliner to come to Des Moines to our meeting of action. I'm going to talk now to Claire Flynn, who is the chairman of Erie County. Mr. Flynn is from Edinburgh, Pennsylvania. Welcome to Des Moines. Thank you. I'm glad to be here and enjoyed the trip very much. Uh, this is quite a meeting for our organization. We have an organization in our county of a considerable number, <coughs> and I, myself and all the members in our area have seen depressed prices in milk and all farm and dairy commodities. I hope this meeting does what it's proposed to do today. We've gone through uh, kickbacks. If some of you people are not familiar with that, that's two-way pricing of milk. 
diverting of milk and everything else. Our county there is primarily dairy, although we have some beef feeding and as Mr. Dickerson said before, considerable grapes, uh, ball grain and fruit. This is Ed Shema at the Veterans Auditorium where the crowd is rolling in for the 1967 National Farmers Organization meeting for action. And we go to Don Mack to interview some of the people that are here. I'm visiting with Hugh Crane, State of Minnesota Public Relations Coordinator. Hugh, uh, what is the attitude uh, in the state of Minnesota among the farmers? Well, the farmers in my state are real unhappy with the grain prices and the uh, prices of other farm products because in the last four or five months, as we all know, corn, for an example, has gone down 25 to 30 cents a bushel. This condition has brought on, a, a, as a result, a situation which could well this fall spend, spell the end for a lot of real good farmers because who can stand that kind of a drop in price? And as a result of this uh, feeling of uh, unhappiness and chagrin and anger, uh, they're up in arms, so to speak, and uh, are real unhappy with the, the uh, powers that be. And they're going to be in attendance here today by the bus load, by the plane load, and by the car load. Uh, our county has three buses, five cars, and the county to the north of us is coming by plane. So uh, we do expect uh, a real big turnout here, and we know that uh, there will be farmers from so many other states uh, feeling, I think, the same as we do, that we would expect that today we will have a meeting of minds and decide for uh, what kind of an action we ought to take uh, regarding these present prices and these present conditions, Don. Thank you. That was Hugh Crane, State of Minnesota Public Relations Coordinator. The first major address at the meeting for action in Des Moines is given by Mr. Homer Jackson of Rifle, Colorado. The reason this crowd wants to hear from Mr. Jackson is not only that they have uh, heard and read his remarks, uh, he has spoken at many farm meetings, but also he has appeared in important farm publications. And more than that, uh, he has been experienced for many years in the production, the financing of beef cattle. He knows that industry backwards and forwards, and he also has a point of view. And uh, this huge crowd at the Veterans Memorial Auditorium are anxious to hear the remarks of Homer W. Jackson of Rifle, Colorado. In nearly every section of the country, real estate valuations are escalating. And by using the inflationary spiral of real estate values as loan collateral, farmers and livestock men have been able to finance their programs and hold on, just hoping that conditions will improve. The facts are that most borrowers have used up the equity in their real estate valuations, and they have reached the maximum borrowing limits on their land. They must receive prices for their product equal to operating costs, or they simply cannot continue in business. This is the crisis year in agricultural credit. Rural banks, production credit associations, farm lenders are beginning to question how much longer can they continue to finance a losing business, as well as question the wisdom of continuing to lend on the inflationary spiral of real estate value. Now, some may draw the conclusion that because agricultural loan volume is increasing, that farm assets are increasing likewise, or that the big loans are bigger because of the increased size of farm and ranch operations. Likewise, there's often accepted theory that the larger operations are more economical and more efficiently managed than the smaller ones. But these conditions are not borne out by our loan experience. First, the expanding size alone does not represent a like expansion in farm assets. Nationally, since 1960, all farm assets have increased in value 33%, while in this same period of time, total farm debts have increased by 84%. And for the most part, 
This increase in farm debt represents the lack of farm income that is being made up with borrowed funds. Secondly, the larger operations that we finance are not showing any more profit per unit than the small, single-family setups. With calves selling, <laughs> you know, with calves selling at $37 a head below the cost of production, the incentive is not there to want to grow very big under those conditions. Under present conditions, the American farmers are now subsidizing the retail profits and the consumers' grocery bills by furnishing food below production costs. <laughs> Rural America is entitled to parity prices for its produce. The monopolistic controls in the food industry cannot be ignored by anyone seeking a solution to agriculture's economic problems. And unless the monopoly issue is publicly recognized, honestly and fairly dealt with, a financial collapse of the rural economy is certain to result in a national crisis unequaled in this nation's history. Thank you. I'm talking now with Mr. J.C. Holland, who is from Plantersville, Mississippi. Uh, Mr. Holland, I'd like to have you know, is an observer at this great meeting for action, and he was also chosen as one of four outstanding young farmers of the whole United States for 1966. We certainly want to welcome you to Des Moines, Mr. Holland. Thank you, sir. It's a privilege to be here. What would you say from your standpoint as a Mississippian and as one with long experience and a uh, certain distinction in farming uh, ought to be the uh, one of the points of emphasis of this meeting here? Uh, research and promotion and prices on the products that we produce in agriculture today. You see that one of the emphasis is price. I see. That's right, yes sir. We about price, we take what the prices that are markets want to give us. We don't have enough voice in price. We should, uh, that the cost, is, the tremendous cost that we have today, our overhead in agriculture, we very certainly ought to have a better price for the products that we produce today because the farmers is the backbone of the United States of America. That's why Amer America is so great with their ability to feed and clothe their nation. This is certainly encouraging to hear you put it this way, uh, Mr. Holland. Of course, you understand this National Farmers Organization is, is meeting here in an effort to put the price tag on the product. Uh, are you uh, pretty substantially in sympathy with this? Yes, I am. Yes, sir. Well, we want to welcome you here to this meeting, and uh, we know that as an observer, you're one of the really intelligent ones, and we're certainly glad you made the scene. Thank you, sir. My nice to be here. Another highlight of this meeting in Des Moines is the appearance of Ed Wimmer of Covington, Kentucky. Mr. Wimmer is vice president and public relations director of the National Federation of Independent Business, representing some 240,000 Main Street business people. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we have four documents, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, the Declaration of Independence, and the Sermon on the Mount. And in those four documents is everything that the world is waiting for and our poor kids in our schools and colleges don't know it. My boy is here with me today and he's decided to follow in my footsteps, believe it or not. Isn't the dream of every family in this audience today the dream of keeping their boys and girls on the farms and finding a way of life for them that they know is good and best for them? How much juvenile delinquency is on the farms of America today? Has there been a 10% increase, a 20% increase? No. But where is this increase? Do you want your boys and girls to end up in the tenements of Detroit? No, of course you don't. So what are you going to do about it? You're going to have to come to one conclusion above all others. That if we don't put a Christian foundation 
under labor, business, and government. We are not going to have any. And without morals in business, morals behind agriculture, morals in organizations like this here, it's not going to be anywhere. And I believe that this organization is built on a moral foundation or I wouldn't be here. Mr. Wimmer's appearance here at Des Moines was quite a crowd pleaser. Uh, he kept returning to this one point, which seemed to uh, satisfy the crowd. He kept saying that it's high time for American business, and he meant Main Street business people, to join forces with American farmers to save our private enterprise system. I'm visiting with Mrs. Doris McElwain, one of the top workers in the National Farmers Organization from the state of Minnesota. Doris? I'd like to have your viewpoints on what do you think is a woman's place in this farm movement? Well, I think that our place is right there with our husbands trying to get a just price. There certainly isn't anything unfeminine about knowing your own business, and farming happens to be our business. We need to stay informed of what's going on so we can keep up with our husbands. Uh, we must remember that half of the 6% population that live in the rural areas are women. So if we don't pitch in and help, you automatically cut your fighting force down to one half before you even start. There are many things we can do. We can read to keep up with our husbands and mark things for him so that he can read them when he has time. We can go to meetings if he can't, or we can go with him to meetings. Uh, we can pitch in and help with a lot of county activities, uh, district or state projects whenever we're asked. These things are all to our own advantage. Any gain that's made in NFO land is made for everyone who belongs to it. We have letters to write to the editors, letters to write to congressmen. We have so many things that we can do. I think that a woman's uh, place in this is limited only by her resourcefulness and imagination. That was Doris McWayne from Graceville, Minnesota. I'm talking now with Reverend E.W. Mueller. Of, uh, he's a staff member of the Lutheran Council of the United States. Uh, Reverend Mueller, I've had the pleasure of hearing you at many farm meetings. Uh, what would you like to see come out of this uh, meeting for action in Des Moines today? I would like to see the farmers leave this meeting with a real resolve to make a commitment to stick together and ask for an adequate price. And, and, and the second thing I'd like to see come out of this is that more of the uh, people who are not farmers, like the Main Street people, that they receive that they realize what they have at stake and give real encouragement to the farmers to make use of the collecting bargaining tool. Those are the two things I'd like to see come out of this. Thank you very much, Reverend E.W. Mueller. From this point onward, undoubtedly many NFO people will consider the President, Orrin Lee Staley, as the Abraham Lincoln of American agriculture. That's the way Vice President Fingston introduced him to the crowd. And then, of course, there was an immense ovation as the president of the NFO began to speak. Orrin Lee Staley, NFO president. This meeting is a symbol of the American farmers' determination to do something about their problems. I do not believe that you left your farms at your own expense and came the distance you did not to come here determined to meet your problems as farmers. And there's only one problem in American agriculture, and that problem is low farm prices. Nothing else. And the only reason that today we have the low farm prices that exist is because enough of the American farmers are willing to sell their products at those low prices. Nothing more and nothing less. We have been in a position to get eight of the nation's 15 largest meat processors to accept production from NFO members under meat marketing arrangements. Last week, another of the majors to make us nine. And why, and why was this important? He had said four years ago, I'll do business with NFO if I have to. And I guess he made up his mind he is going to have to because he started accepting supply. And I understand that in a 
publication, he stated that it appeared that now the processors were going to have to deal with organized farmers and pay them an additional price for volume. This was the very processor that a few years ago said, I'll deal with NFO when I have to. And one of the facts was that I'm sure that he was convinced that we mean business. <laughs> it's time that the American farmers that are members of the NFO adopt a slogan no price, no production, and absolutely carry out what it means step by step. And if they're going to buy our products, that if they're going to buy our products in the future, that we do it and sell it only when we get a price for it as a result of step by step. We believe that the sound approach is to go out of here today and let the processors of this nation know that we are building for an all-out holding action that would include every commodity with the intention of shutting down the agricultural plant until we got a price for our products on all commodities. This is what we believe. establishment as the year goes on to put a floor of a dollar and fifty cents a bushel on corn, two dollars on wheat and three dollars on soybean as a major commodity. And how are we going to do it? We want this to be the floor that's established that farmers will sell for and that they put their production in the NFO grain bank not to be sold for less than a dollar and fifty cents a bushel on corn, two dollars on wheat, and three dollars on soybeans. And then, whatever is left over, if we get the participation that we believe we should get, whatever's left over, we'll sell for export for whatever we can get for it. But we'd start out next year at zero when harvest came if we can get the support of the grain farmers of this country. One of the most distinguished guests of this meeting for action today is Herr Klaus Brocher, who is uh, an observer here from the European Common Market. Mr. Brocher is Under Secretary of State for Agricultural Affairs for Germany, he is also a consultant for the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, which is oftentimes known in this country as the World Bank. He is also a consultant for the Kennedy Round of the General Agreements on Tariffs and Trade, which we know by the initials GATT. And he also uh, works in his own country as consultant for banks and insurance companies. So you see, he is he's well versed and long experienced in agricultural affairs in Europe. And he has come here to watch this historic meeting at Des Moines. Uh, Herr Brocher, why don't you just go ahead and make the comments that you'd like to make about this meeting for action? Well, first of all, I dare say that I'm very much impressed by what I have seen and heard today. Well, I do understand uh, your resolutions quite well, as I might say that uh, the American farmer is going to have an uh, organization what has been more or less uh, today concluded what the European market already has completed, in some respect at least. And I understand that the share of the American farmer he gets from of the retail price is, uh, I dare say, the lowest in the world. So you must do something to get uh, uh, the advantage of the margins. And uh, so I quite understand that uh, you got ambitions to run the whole thing by yourself as far as you can. And uh, I think uh, this should be done for the future, uh, also in the responsibility for the coming generations. This is what I would like to mention uh, to this big meeting. Uh, I understand the biggest in the world, biggest farm meeting in the world that has ever been uh, taken place. 
One thing I've heard said sometimes is that the cooperatives that we have in the United States were, were inherited uh, pretty much unaltered from cooperative structures in agriculture in Europe in the 19th century. Uh, would you say that that's true? I think so, and uh, uh, if I may say so, I would say if the cooperative system would have worked uh, in the whole line as many had expected until now, well, they could have taken over a lot of the uh, work, what uh, is your goal for the future? I see. In other words, the NFO seems to be carrying on a goal that originally might have been or should have been theirs. Exactly what it is. I've, I've heard uh, farmers in this country say so too. I see. I've certainly enjoyed visiting with you, Herr Brocher. Thanks Talking with Mr. Klaus Brocher, who is an observer from the European Common Market. This brings us to a close to this dramatic event of history of the NFO meeting for action. As Homer Jackson expressed it in his speech, he said that this was the largest farm group held under one roof and that the National Farmers Organization is the only organization that could accomplish this. Ed, I'd like to ask you exactly what do you think the attitude of the farmers will be after they go home? I think it's uh, nothing but uh, determination to do uh, the complete job of uh, uh, collective bargaining for farmers in terms of getting a better price for the products. What was the attendance here today? According to the manager of the uh, Veterans Memorial Building, the attendance was 35,400, Don. Phil, what is your observation today of the meeting? It seemed to me that after they'd had considerable discussion of a number of points, uh, they had adopted three major items on an agenda that President Staley put before them. And after this, uh, I got, uh, it seemed to me, one of the best quotes of the whole day when Staley said that what they had authorized doing was conducting the granddaddy of them all as far as holding actions were concerned. And then he said, uh, in a more serious vein, that uh, these farmers had served notice to the American public in general and also to agriculture that farmers are no longer willing to put up with the present price structure for farm products. And he said that what they had actually done is authorize an all-out holding action on all farm commodities. In other words, as he put it, to shut down the whole agricultural plant in order to back up their feeling that this price structure absolutely will not do. Uh, Staley also said at another point, uh, after they'd had a discussion and uh, adopted several points on the agenda, that uh, what collective bargaining means, and he kept returning to this point, is bargaining together and selling together. Uh, he kept returning to that point, and he also said that what they were going to have to do is to go out and talk to their neighbors and get them to join with the NFO. It seems to me it was a great and historic meeting, as he said. It one of the, one of the greatest demonstrations of solidarity in agriculture that I've ever seen. This has been Phil Allen and Ed Shima and myself, Don Mack, bringing to you the action from Des Moines Veterans Auditorium on the NFO Meeting for Action for U.S. Farm Report.